Sorry, I, oh. I was having <laughs> internet issues. Okay, thank you, Prof. Abbasi. Uh, we can start. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, uh, good, yeah, salam. good morning and uh, good good afternoon uh, here in the afternoon uh, in, in Indonesia. Uh, respectable Professor Dr. Mashkuri MSE, uh, Rector of University of Islam Malang, uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, we have uh, Assistant Professor Farha Abbasi, medical doctor from Department of Psychiatry, Michigan State University. Uh, respectable Assistant Professor Dr. Rahma Triana, PhD, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, University of Islam Malang. Uh, respectable Associate Professor Lukman, uh, Vice Dean, Faculty of Psychology, Universitas Negeri Makassar, Indonesia. Respectable uh, Vice Rector of Collaboration and Academic Affairs, Professor Junaidi, uh, PhD. Respectable, the Director of uh, ASEAN Study Center, Michigan State University. Respectable, the Associate Director of uh, ASEAN uh, Study of Michigan State University, Dr. Isabella Tirto Waluyo. Uh, distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Yang kami hormati, Bapak Rektor Unisma, Bapak Profesor Dr. Haji Mashkuri, MSI. Yang terhormat, uh, Wakil Rektor Baidang Akademik dan Kerjasama Unisma, Profesor Junaidi MPD PSD. Yang kami hormati, narasumber hadir di tengah-tengah kita, Profesor Abasi, Medical Doctor dari Michigan State University Amerika Serikat, Ibu Dekan Fakultas Kedokteran Unisma, Ibu Dr. Rahma Triana PSD, Associate Profesor Lukman dari uh, Fakultas Psikologi Universitas Negeri Makassar, Dekan Direktur ASEAN Study Michigan State University beserta Wakil Direktur yang diwakili oleh Ibu Dr. Isabella Tirto Waluyo. Bapak Ibu yang kami hormati, ladies and gentlemen, Alhamdulillah we can get together uh, in international uh, online uh, webinar with the theme Faith and Mental Health, the Role of Religion, Spirituality in Our Resilience and Wellness. We already have the speakers already joining us. And uh, to start this international web webinar, I would like to invite our rector, Professor Dr. Haji Mashkuri, MSE, to uh, give a welcoming speech and officially open this international webinar. Please join us in welcoming Professor Dr. Mashkuri, MSE. di unmute Pak Jiman. Oke. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and good afternoon. Respectable Dr. Farha Abbasi, Department of Psychiatry. Michigan State University, respectable Dr. Rahmat Triliana, MKS, PSD, Dean, Faculty of Medis Medicine, Universitas Islam Malang, respectable Associate Professor Lukman, SPSI, Vice Dean, Faculty of Psikologi, Universitas Negeri Makassar, respectable Prof. Junaidi, PSD, Vice Rector, of Academic and Collaboration Affair, Unisma Malang, Respectable Professor Sidar Chandra, Director of Asian Studies Center, Michigan State University, Respectable All Faculty Member from Michigan State University, Universitas Islam Malang, and Universitas Negeri Makassar. Ladies and gentlemen, and all participants of this international webinar. Thank you participants from Malaysia, from Brunei Darussalam, from USA, from Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UNISMA, I am very happy to welcome our speaker from United States, 
of America and Indonesia. Welcome to the University of Islamalang. UNISMA has been growing to strengthen and develop its national and international collaboration and uh, reputation. Through its excellent services, achievements, and joint international program and events, our motto is from Nahdlatul Ulama for Indonesia and for the world civilization. This online webinar is very important for us to know more about fight and mental health, especially the role of religion, spirituality in our resilience and wellness. It is also important to strengthen the collaboration between Indonesia and the United States of America, between Indonesia, uh, between Universitas Islam Malang and Michigan State University and Universitas Negeri Makassar. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Unisma Malang, I would like to deliver my appreciation to the organizing committee from Asian Study Center and Department of Psychiatry of Michigan State University, the, the Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Islam Malang, and Faculty of Psychology of Universitas Negeri Makassar. By saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I, I officially open this international webinar that is all from me. Wallahul muwafiq lami tariq. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Mashkuri, the Rector of Nisma Malang, for the welcoming speech and for opening this international webinar. Terima kasih, Bapak Rektor, telah membuka acara pada international webinar pada uh, malam hari ini dan pada pagi hari ini waktu Michigan, Amerika Serikat. Uh, Bapak Ibu yang kami hormati, untuk acara selanjutnya adalah uh, presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, the next agenda is presentation from our speakers. Uh, will be moderated by uh, Bapak Rio Rizandiansyah, uh, PhD from the Faculty of Medicine of Unisma Malang. Uh, Pak Rio, uh, time is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much for um, your attendance. Good morning and good evening for everybody who is attending. Um, the first speaker is um, from Michigan University, uh, Department of Psychiatry. Um, Assistant Professor Dr. Farha Basi. Uh, I will share her slides and um, of course if um, there are questions we can ask them in a different topic, uh, sorry, different time slot which is which is after the, the speak, uh, has, all the speakers has um, finished his speech. So for um, Professor, sorry, for uh, Professor Dr. Basi, uh, please your time is yours. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so I'm glad you guys got the, uh, so very sorry, we, uh, we uh, had some internet issues, so I was uh, delayed because of that. But without wasting any more time, thank you so much for this opportunity and Michigan State University Psychiatry Department looks really, uh, looks forward to collaborating in any possible way to uh, kind of, create more educational webinars and programs. So my, I wanted to touch base on uh, how and why it is important to bring faith and uh, religion into well-being and in discussion of how can one improve one's mental health. So um, uh, can I move my slides or you're going to move it? I I'll have it? to. I'll have to move. But so okay. you just say Can next you go slide. to the next slide? Go to the next. You can go to that. So we know that uh, mental illnesses have been. Uh, it's we have been facing a crisis of mental health or mental illnesses world over. Like uh, right now, after COVID nineteen, we are anticipating a pandemic of mental illnesses. We already know in United States, the numbers are going up. It's not only depression, anxiety, but rates of completed suicide, 
and also the social isolation, social distancing, quarantining has impacted, not only directly impacted the mental health, but then you are indulging in more unhealthy coping skills. People, we see a rate of substance abuse going increasing. So all that, and already we know that whatever country we talk about world over, the focus on mental health is not there. So we do not have the resources to face this. But so we already, this was a prediction pre-COVID-19 that by year, this year, that the second most frequent cause of disability worldwide is depression. But I'm really concerned with the rate of completed suicide increasing in the age group of 15 to 44 years, and especially in women of color in the United States. So that's where my focus is. That's where I'm working right now. We can go to the next slide. But I think the biggest concern that I have, because my focus has been uh, our uh, own faith community, which is a Muslim community here in the country, uh, especially in Michigan. What happened when I started practicing in Michigan, um, so Michigan is considered one of the highest Muslim population area in the country. But when I started practicing, I was very surprised that not many patients were coming to the clinic, but when I would go for praying, everybody would try and corner me and talk to me that uh, my son is not doing well, my daughter is not doing well, wife, husband, but they didn't want to access care. And especially I remember one incident where we were looking for a psychotic kid who was threatening to kill his family. He was a college kid. And the family finally found out that he's praying in the masjid. And I said, that's fine. We can go and get him admitted from the masjid. And they said, no, we don't want the community to know about it. To me, that was really concerning. And I realized that if we are going to do any uh, good work, we have to bring faith leaders in this conversation. So I know a lot of time we talk about that this mental health is a Western phenomena. It doesn't impact us. We have very, like, you know, we have strong faith. We have family values. We shouldn't be impacted. But when we say that one in four in the United States are getting impacted by mental uh, health concerns, that includes the, um, uh, any faith community, any color, any gender. So it does not matter any socioeconomic status. That's what we are realizing. Yes, all these factors can be protective, but you have to bring it in the treatment format. You, it, if you want it to be preventive, we have to really change our approach. So the first thing I always talk about is that the concept that mental illnesses is somehow alien or not part of our culture. I always try and dispel that. And this is what, when we even start with the basic Sharia in Islam, you see that uh, your intellect, preservation of your intellect is your first basic uh, tenet. Like Islam is one religion where mental competence is the basis of you being identified as practicing Muslim. Because if you are not mentally competent, you are majnoon. In Quran, it says majnoon. This means you are exempted. You are exempted from your religious duties. You are exempted from your societal duties. In fact, everyone in the community is supposed to take care of you. But that is when you are mentally ill. So if you go back to the basic concept that you cannot be a practicing, like you can be a Muslim just by being born in a Muslim uh, household or in a country, Muslim country, but in order for you to be a practicing Muslim, you should understand, you should think about it, you should say, you should act on it, you should believe on it, so then only. So preservation of your akal, your intellect is the basic tenet to me in Islam. Then we can go to the next slide. Then I, we are very familiar that whatever the practice of Islam is, the concept of wellness 
and welfare run parallel to each other. So any ibadah that you do, be it fasting, be it prayers, um, it is two, three things are very important. One thing is it's highly recommended to be in community, right? So it, is, it starts with your own wellness. Everything is about you taking care of yourself. And a healthy individual is the basic unit of Islamic society. And when we say healthy individual, it means you have to be at your optimum physical and mental wellness. So it, it is kind of a mandatory duty for you to not only take care of yourself, but then every act of self-preservation is connected to community wellness, welfare. So let's say if we are fasting, you are detoxifying. Now everybody talks about intermittent fasting to lose weight and being healthy. So fasting is now medically proven, right? So when you are fasting, you are taking care of yourself, but when you are, it is advisable to then share your resources, your food, your uh, uh, money, uh, your time. So time, talent, treasure, you take care of yourself, consume it first for your need, but then you are supposed to take care of others in the society. So we already, what we are now using for mental health resilience was given to us already in form of Islam. But I not only say Islam, any faith-based community, which is kind of, uh, uh, is a practicing community, is using these concepts. So I see it very common when I work in interfaith setting, I see it very prevalent, not only in Islam, but in other communities as well. We can go to the other slide. So, but what happens, and again, this I see in a lot of faith communities, they are, are because we don't understand mental illnesses, they feel that if we talk about depression, anxiety, it is like we are acknowledging a weakness of our faith, that something is not right. We are not believing in God enough. Or you could also, you will see the people who are practicing religion will get very, um, you know, every time you are going through depression and anxiety, you can have a crisis of your faith that why is God doing this to me? Why is uh, God punishing me? So all this is our surrounding mental illnesses and that's where the stigma comes, right? And stigma, even till today, is the biggest barrier in care of your mental health. People don't access because they want to, because they don't understand it in a disease model. They think it is our faith, our belief system that's not working, that kind of, if we talk about it, somehow we are forsaking our beliefs or our religion or our God. So first thing I always work with is that mental illness is not an ethical, moral uh, failure, right? It is not a spiritual weakness. We can go to the other slide. Other thing we see, so I want to talk about the overlap between spiritual concerns or spiritual struggles and mental illnesses. So another thing we commonly see that when you are psychotic or in case of bipolar, if you are having a manic episode, you are having delusions, it is higher the chance that you would have delusional religious uh, beliefs. So people would say, oh, God is talking to me. God is giving me commands to do this. Or you start believing, oh, I am God. I can do this. So, you know, the grandiosity. So it is very important to understand that. that and although these religious delusions can happen even in someone who does not belong to a faith, but it is more prevalent and stronger if you belong to a faith community. So we can go to the next slide. Now we see in America, especially and in the psychiatric world, that people, they, everyone is understanding the importance of faith and religion because um, 
especially in America, what happened is when you separated state and religion was separated, then people stopped talking about religion and faith in medical community. So what happened was that people like, especially medical field, people would be hesitant to ask you about your faith or your practices. But now that we are coming back to wellness and mind and body medicine together, this concept is coming back because we realize that if you belong to a faith community, then your religion, your faith is the center of your being. So it is like if I come in and ask you about your medical symptoms, but I don't ask you what you eat, uh, what's your lifestyle? So when we talk about biopsychosocial models of disease, it is important that we also talk about where in your religion you are, or do you, if you are not in a practiced religion, then you can be maybe believing in spirituality, or you could be just doing meditation as your self-preservation. So it is important to talk about it. So finally, our psych book, DSM-5, which kind of we use as to standardize diagnosis criteria of mental illnesses, identified one category about uh, having, you know, a spiritual crisis, but it's only very limited to, to people who might be losing their faith or might be converting from one religion to the other, and that might be causing and contributing to their depression or anxiety. So it's, it's basically touching it, but not taking it in full account. But what's happening with the practice though, it is very, now faith-based practice has become a very big component because of the, another thing that's happening is because of the resources being limited, the faith communities are being brought in to fill in those gaps. We realize that and we can go to the next slide. that we realize that religion and spirituality can be very important in your behavior changes, in your mental uh, well-being, in your thinking process. So, <clears throat> and also what we realize that in our community specifically, when, in our community, when I say, I mean Muslim community specifically, what we see that people when they are struggling with mental illnesses would go to an Imam first before they end up with a physician. So keeping that model, go to the next slide, please. We see this is the help seeking patterns, right? And if you see, unfortunately, mental health services come very low. And what we see is then we, by the time they get to a mental health provider, it is in crisis or having a kind of like, you know, in struggle. So they are either trying to hurt themselves, hurting someone else, or are in a, in a legal situation, uh, some, some uh, violence, some kind of violence that they become either victim of the violence or they get into criminal system. So sadly, most of like majority of our patients are in prison bar, uh, right now. So we are trying to change that trajectory and we are looking at who else can we bring in this uh, system that we can kind of fill in these cracks? And there's that's why, if you see the faith leader's role become really important. We can go to the next slide. And I just wanted to tell you guys that I'm not reading the questions yet because I'm going through the slide words. So this I've already talked about that it is it was it is such a, a, a strong need to bring faith leaders into this conversation. Uh, we can go to the next. So keeping that in mind, we created this model of collaborative care where the faith leaders in the community and especially imams uh, and a lot of community leaders were trained in first aid mental health and so the point behind it was that not, a faith leader will not 
become a, a mental health provider, but they should be aware, should know what it entails when someone is depressed, when someone is anxious, somebody's having a psychotic breakdown, or somebody is thinking of hurting themselves, that if they go to the faith leader first, that they are able to identify it. So this is kind of what we did was a first aid mental health training. And uh, then the idea behind it was that once we respectfully develop boundaries, it was very important because think of it this way. I might be from uh, a practicing faith, but I'm not the authority on the religious uh, uh, text, right? I, I might know of what Islam or religion entails, but I'm not an authority. I'm not standing on the pulpit, right? So I can kind of help them and talk that language, but I cannot say with authority that I know this is what is there. In the same way, the imams might be trained and know of mental illnesses, but they cannot come out and say, oh, this is the treatment you should take, or this is the medicine you should take or not take, right? But when we both came together with mutual respect, we created that collaborative model that if imam sees depression, anxiety, or red flags, they can refer to me. And if in my patient, I see some spiritual crisis happening, I can refer to the imam. And I will give you an example after this. So this is the, in the last Ramadan, uh, we had this case. This was a young person um, who was fasting, not sleeping. And you know, that's the age group where you usually have your first psychotic breakdown. It's college going kids. He's a little bit older for that, but we usually, that's the time period that your first psychotic breakdown can happen. So this kid is from a very respectable religious family. He was fasting, he wasn't sleeping, and then he had his first breakdown. And he started seeing, uh, having spiritual experiences where he's seeing heaven and hell, and he was breaking away from reality. And he started believing he's getting messages from God. So of course, first he went to the Imam and Imam read Rukaya, and I'm sure you all must be aware that in uh, Islamic, uh, the, it's an Islamic way of dealing with the, when people feel they are being possessed, they have this set of prayers. So Imam uh, sat with him, did his prayers, uh, but then Imam also, because he was trained uh, in uh, this mental health training, he could identify psychosis. So he said that we will continue to pray, but please do contact Dr. Abbasi as well. You might need more treatment. And when the patient came to me, I identified his psychosis, started him on meds, but I also said, continue to pray with your imam as well. So that this was the ultimate collaborative model that we successfully were able to intervene early on and now that kid is doing much better. He's continuing to do his ibadah, but he's also on a good medication to help him get through his psychosis. So this is the model that I will do the evaluation, I will do prescribe the medications, but then they can continue to pray with the imam. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So this is where I talk about faith-based mental health that I think it is very important because another thing, another example, there are moments that even if I'm a Muslim, like, like let's say my bipolar patients, when they come to me and are fasting, I can tell them that, look, I know that the religion gives you an exemption to fasting that you, you can avoid fasting, but they might say, oh, you are a doctor, what do you know, right? But when I say it, and when the local imam validates it, 
that yes, you can be exempted from fasting same way like any other health issues, then it is more a strong model. We can go to the next slide. And this is the picture of one of the trainings. And the important piece is it is not based on religion as such. It is religious in approach. Uh, we, we have adapted the language to fit a model, cultural model. But at the same time, it is not teaching religion as such. So we, it's not based on any fake or it doesn't get into any religious conflict. So it is very academic. It is what we are teaching in our academic institutes, but it, we kind of give it more religious flavor. We adapt it so it is more uh, practical to be applicable to the community. So that, that was my slides in short, and I can answer questions. Okay, so thank you, uh, Dr. Abbasi. Of course, um, I would remind, um, we would have a, a session for discussion after all the speakers, I think, would be better. So um, let me introduce the next speaker, and I will uh, also note the questions from the participants in the comment section, and I will um, collate them and read them later. Um, as for the next speaker, is from our university. It's um, Dr. Ahmad Riliana. Are you there? <laughs> oh wait, my camera is off. Okay, hold on. Dr. Ahmad? Yep, uh, I'm okay. sharing my slide, okay? Yes. Or is Thank it from you. yours? No, okay. I, don't, I don't have your slides. <laughs> so you, so you, can, you can share them. Okay, All so right. next speaker is uh, Dr. Madrilena. Uh, the time is yours. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> distinguished guests and speakers today, good evening and also good morning from and any other range of time at the moment because it's international we don't know your time at the moment we are in indonesia it's now it's seven uh, probably in a western or eastern part could be different but uh for you today and have um have take away some of the experiences or um knowledge that we share today I'm not sure why my slice is not working. Oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, is it okay? No? Okay. All right. So, I'm not really sure how I touch on these issues because as a Dean of Faculty of Medicine, I'm not experienced in psychiatry and also we are still on a way to increase or involve in more on a psychiatry or mental health and mental care for patients and also for our students therefore i uh, will touch more on what is indonesian situations at the moment and how we as faculty of medicine can contribute or can help with the problems that we have at the moment so as you all know that Indonesia, based on the 2014, we have a population of more than 250, 50 million. And at the moment, we are probably 270. And with our national income, about 3,000. And we have, <clears throat> and we have become part of the middle class or middle uh, country with income inequality about 38.1. And our urbanizations and poverty line as such, it can be read in the slides. We have life expectancy of 68 years based on the 2006 data. Based on this data, we can see that Indonesia has first, we have many um, people that we need to be, that we need to take care of. And we don't have enough resources or money to make sure that everyone have a, have a good qualified care for each and every person. Therefore, we need to think of a way how to address or maybe how to deal with mental health or mental illness or mental issues that happens in the society. 
So we cannot talk about health without talking about mental health because health is physical and mental. Therefore, the need to identify the feeling like grief, anxiety, phobia, post-traumatic stress, stress, or even feeling shame or panic or having depression or having manics or any other mental issues should be addressed or should be talked about in a way that was not discouraging people to talk or come forward if they feel that they have problems or they have issue. So therefore, mental illness is an emotional, psychological, and social well-being, which affect how we think, feel, or act. It helps us to determine uh, how we handle stress and relate to others and also make choices. And this is very important in every life stages from childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. Uh, many factors are contributing into the mental health problem, such as biological factors like genes, brain chemistry, and neural frameworks. As we all, all know that now, we know that moods, um, feelings, is not just about feelings, but it turned out that they have certain chemicals that triggers and also change those feelings, and therefore it's also influencing, influenced by biological factors. Life ex experience also contributed a lot into the mental health, such as trauma, abuse, uh, substance use, and also probably now it's environmental issues too, because some poison such as lead or others can affect the uh, neural systems and also affects the brain chemistry and change the mental health status of a person. Family history with mental health problem can also be a factor, contributing factor, because it's also related to genes. In Indonesia, serious mental illnesses or psychosis based on 2013 data shows a middle um, median is about two, uh, 0 0.27 with psychological problems is about um, six. Based on this, we have also known that the Human Rights Watch has also mentioned that in Indonesia, many of the mental illnesses patients is about 14 million, and we only have 48 mental hospitals. With estimated patients that was shackled or pasung in Bahasa Indonesia, that's when they have a mental illness or they have perceived to have a mental disability or they have mental problem, they were shackled or they were chained and then put in a confined space. And then they were like uh, sometimes put in a very unhumane condition. And this could make the, the mental problem or mental issue worse. Therefore, one of the Indonesian goals now is just to, is to make sure there is no more pasung or no more shackled in patients with mentally who is mentally ill. So people with real or perceived mental illness will live, will still many are still live in shackled or locked up in a confined space or considered not normal or considered dangerous or considered. Um, a threat to the society or a threat to their family. The problem in Indonesia is that physical well-being is considered as healthy. Even though healthy is also mean a healthy mind, not just a healthy body. Therefore, the change in our perspective in thinking that physical well-being is health. That means if we are physically healthy, even though we are mentally ill, then we are healthy, which is not. And the wellness concept is still considered foreign because we, will, we are still considered that physical health is more important and mental health is unimportant. Because if it was unimportant, some still consider that mental care are non-essential. It means that when you think there is a mental problem, then you provide the mental care, not previous so there is no prevention methods in doing so in many situations there is still a huge stigma stigma or um, um, negative uh, negative perspective on patients with 
uh, mentally ill, who is mentally ill or having mental illness. And this probably due to the low public awareness of mental health and early mental sign, mental illness sign. One of, one of the problems that also could be an adversity is that we have so much cultural and religious diversity. In some cases that could present a problem because for instance, if I'm from, um, I have a student who's, who's coming from um, Eastern part, which, is, which, doesn't speak in, uh, which doesn't speak Javanese at all. And then when he studies here, he has problems with Javanese speaking and then he cannot address it to anyone. And he just kept that problem himself. And then thinking that he was not good enough, therefore that he has a low grades and then he succumbed to depression. Therefore, cultural and religious diversity can be an adversary. It can be a detrimental effect. It can bring out the problem as a part of the problem in mental health. The mental health care in Indonesia, based on the data of the 2011, you can see that we have many things that was not recorded well. However, from 2011 until up to now, I still remember that we only have 48 mental hospitals for, uh, for 17,000 islands in Indonesia, for, for 270 million people that would make the rate is about 0.02% for 10,000 populations. And the number of beds in the mental hospitals is only 7,700, which only like 3.31%, which means that Indonesia still think that mental health care is a non-essential. The, the problem that I'm addressing now as the Dean of Faculty of Medicine is that the workforce or the training that was provided for especially medical doctors to be or to work in a mental health care is very low. As you can see, the number of psychiatrists is only 0 0.01, which is for 10,000 um, 10, um, citizens which of course is not ideal. And with this in in idealistic way, in, in a, in, we, we have this so low resources. Therefore, in 2019, some have already estimated that we, are, that we need more than 7,500 more mental health care workers, which provide sufficient psychiatric services and also uh, increase the um, availability of drugs or uh, medication or care to more than 70 or 85% of patients which is coming from a low income or middle income um, families, which is one of Indonesian problem. One of the Indonesia problem is poverty. Uh, many of um, our fellow citizens doesn't have enough food to put on the table. So we are simply just doesn't have enough. Therefore, what can we as a faculty of medicine do to um, improve this condition, maybe um, make it a little bit better? So the faculty of medicine UNISMA has put forth mental health care and issues as one of its research and community program. So we have partnered with the Rumah Sakit Rajiman Bodio Diningrat Hospital or Rumah Sakit Jiwa Lawang to have a collaboration, collaboration in research in patients with mental illness. And this has been part of our education in the setting of clerk, clerkship and also horsemanship and also some internship has been done in that hospital from, in, from University of Islam Malang. We also involve in teaching, education, and also increase public awareness on mental health and mental illness. We have made a community um, service, sort of like um, uh, pengabdian masyarakat, that's a um, community service, is to increase the health uh, awareness or mental health awareness and also to identify an early sign of mental illness. 
We are also partnered with other hospitals which have collaboration with Universitas Islam Malang, such as Rumah Sakit um, Sam Rabu, uh, Samba Miratu Ebu di Bangkalan, in, is, um, is in Madura. And we have also one partner in Banyuwangi with Lambangan. We also have partnered with uh, Blitar, uh, Madi Waluyo, and also Kepanjen to help provide with mental health and mental health care in um, community setting. The thing that I would like to a bit share to you is that what we, uh, Faculty of Medicine, have done in term of um, in term of um, increasing mental awareness. Uh, in clinical and preclinical setting, we increase access to mental health and mental health care and services for students during graduate or clinical study. So we have a counseling center with certified psychologists. So we have uh, like a counseling center. So we have a place where students can come and have a talk with a person or someone that can help them with their issues. We also improve and enhance uh, with also enrich lecturers as academic advices. So just like what uh, um, Dr. Abashi mentioned, that the it's sort of like a first aid mental health to so the academic advisor or the lecturers are able to detect or maybe sense or maybe like uh, sound the red alarm to the a counseling center that some students are facing uh, problems, whether they are uh, academic or non-academic issues. So whether they have uh, non-academic issues that influencing their study or influencing their grades, or also um, uh, grades that influence their mental health, because sometimes students now still think that grades determine their um, worth, which is of course not. And also, we are trying to inspire future young doctors or the next, um, the next medical doctors from uh, Universitas Islam Malang to be a healthcare professional that ha that are able to provide um, provide a mental um, mental uh, support for patients and also for their colleagues, and hopefully they would take a mental health a specialty or become psychiatrists because Indonesia at the moment really, really need more psychiatrists. Yeah. And the things that we issue to the students is that uh, for the teachers to learn to identify some of the early mental health issues, which is like uh, students who are like feeling sad all the time or having concentration problems, or maybe having anger management issues. So we have a case like uh, there's one student that keep on getting angry, and we thought it was sort of like cultural, but it's not. <laughs> um, so we managed to pick that up from the uh, um, the adversary, uh, the academic advisor, or the lecturer that was in um, sort of like irresponsible for that student. We can also start at the moment like uh, detecting some students that have probably suicidal thoughts or maybe extreme mood changes, uh, sleeping problems and such. And hopefully we can prevent them from going to stage four, which is uh, symptoms that are very severe and could jeopardize someone's life. Therefore, we always say to our students, make sure your mental health is a priority. So make sure that you're not only healthy as individuals, as a physically healthy, but you also have to have a mental health, mentally health. Um, you have to have a healthy mind and a healthy set of thinkings. And we always said like, well, actually I stole this from Chibi. It's, uh, just remember these two rules. Be nice to others and be nice to yourself. Don't criticize yourself too much, but also don't forget to evaluate yourself so you could improve more. Just don't overdo it. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, thank you. And that is the experience from uh, University wow. of Islam Malang, from um, our faculty of medicine, and especially in using the academic advisors as those who are able to 
uh, detect or like um, sense that some of the students are having uh, mental problems. Thank you for the time. I return it to moderator. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rama, for the wonderful speak, uh, speech. Sorry, <laughs> it's kind of late. So, um, not really. So, the next speaker is um, from. Sorry, I'm having a. <laughs> I'm having problems. Uh, apologies. Hello, so man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the next speaker is uh, Associate Professor Lukman from uh, Universitas Negeri Makassar. Uh, he is a vice dean of the Faculty of uh, Psychology. So to Professor Lukman, the time is yours. I think you are still muted, Professor. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and good evening. Uh, before I present the uh, uh, well-being in psychological perspective, I would like to share about the definition. About the definition of well-being in psychology. Uh, in psychology, there, there is at least three definition of what is uh, well-being, and APA uh, use the definition as a state of happiness and contentment. Uh, if we look at this the definition, uh, well-being is related to it emotion, but it's also uh, look at the physical and mental health or a good quality of life. So this definition uh, uh, means so many uh, aspects in life, including emotion and uh, quality, uh, uh, quality of life. Another definition is the experience of health, happiness, and prosperity. With this definition, we, we see that uh, well-being means so many positive things which is including emotion, health, or social connected with others and purpose and meaning in, in life. In Islam, there is uh, at least four definition which might associate with happiness. The first one is pala, means get what you are looking for. In Surah Al-Mu'minun, it states get qad aflaha al-mu'minun, qad aflaha, means you get what you want. Another uh, uh, terms in Alcuans, which is associated with happiness, is Sa'id or Sa'adat, which is means when you get, when individual got into trouble and someone get help, in, in this case, Allah or God helped him. Two others. Uh, words which is associated with happiness, which is najah, means selamat or free from fighting threats, and najah, which is means berhasil in Indonesia, uh, which is means that what we has been dream of turned out to be granted, even though it is impossible to achieve. With this, um, with this uh, terms or uh, concept in mind. So uh, it is uh, the, the terms well-being has a lot of uh, meaning and most of the study in Muslim countries uh, associated with, with well-being use the term, uh, use the concept of well-being uh, in Western countries, this one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, they use this concept instead of uh, the concept in Islamic. Uh, for instance, one study in uh, Indonesia uh, we, uh, used the concept of uh, satisfaction with life scale, which one of the component of subjective well-being. Uh, instead of using the concept of uh, well-being or happiness in 
uh, Islamic our Islamic uh, terms. Okay. Before we uh, go to the uh, uh, well-being in Islamic, in order to understand how and why religiosity in Islamic influence well-being, we need to examine first the beliefs, practices, values of those who all themselves called themselves Muslims. There's at least six pillars or beliefs in Islam beliefs in God, etc., until the belief of destiny. The word Islam itself means in religious context, submission to Allah, to submission to God. And based on Quran, Hadith, and or Sunnah, uh, saying of the Prophet reported by others or doing of the Prophet reported by others, uh, these uh, beliefs were uh, taught to Muslim society. Beliefs in Allah. Uh, Muslim believes that God sees everything humans do, hears everything, controls everything, and nothing happens against his will. At the same time, people have free choice to do things either according to God's will or against it. But humans are responsible for these choices. The fact that prophets are human beings means that it is possible for people to follow uh, uh, prophets and live the way prophets do. Although regular people cannot be as perfect as prophets, everyone can learn from them and seek to, uh, everyone can learn from Prof, uh, Muhammad and seek to follow their teachings. Uh, the main source of Islamic teaching is the Holy Quran and Sunnah and Hadith is the secondary sources. And uh, belief of this one is uh, one of the pillars as I stated uh, before. Uh, destiny. All events and happenings in life have a purpose and there are no random occurrence. Mm. As, uh, as God stated that it was not without purpose that we created you, we created the heavens, we created the earth, earth and everything in between. And everything God created has been decided before. The death is not the end of life. Quality of life of the death is determined by individual performance during individual life. Uh, the second thing says Islamic practices. Uh, Muslims practice prayers, giving uh, uh, materials to the poor people, fasting during the month, Ramadan, and participating in Hajj. Uh, one of the direct relationship between Allah and individuals is a prayer. So when, when, indiv when Muslims have uh, problems, they might uh, uh, teach prayers or uh, go to the God by Salah or by Doa. These are uh, uh, three or four values in Islam. Uh, one is this uh, ethical value. Uh, Muslims are thought to compare themselves to those who are less fortunate in terms of material possessions, uh, but to look up to and try to emulate those who live virtuous lives. Feelings of equality with others and a sense of fairness can help Muslim to combat feelings of low self-esteem, thereby enhancing the health of individual and the community generally. Another uh, failure from Muslim is positive attitude. Uh, to be op optimistic even in their darkest moment. Uh, Muslim put an importance of family there is no excuse for men not to marry even they were uh, have more time to engage in uh, religious activities and marriage is considered a religious practice and taking good care of family members is one of the priority in islamic teachings the importance of work uh, people who work 
if they are able, are more respected than those who do not. People who work and produce more self-esteem and respect for themselves and therefore experience might experience better mental health. Uh, work also may have a positive impact uh, on physical health. Spending money. Uh, there are uh, numerous emphasis on giving uh, or spending money in Quran. Uh, one of them is uh, how to spend or giving sadaqah or zakat to other people. Okay. Now we come to the, what is the roles of beliefs, practice and values in Islamic uh, prophecy? There is at least nine. One is uh, give a positive worldview for Muslim. Events are not random and uh, therefore I have no ultimate significant or meaning. Uh, individual or Muslim who does good and he has more value will be rewarded either in his life or in the next. Uh, when Muslims have suffered shrik or trauma, Allah has a purpose for them to test the person or to purify the, to purify the person, to change situation both in their lives and lives of other Salah, salat is a tool for coping and to help structure of life and remind Muslim to think about Allah and to submit to Allah's will. A satisfying answer only uh, religious have this answer to the ultimate question in life and science has no answer to this question at all nor will they have answer. Uh, another and in, uh, influence of these beliefs, values is on psychological coping and social mechanism is uh, healthy decision making. Uh, because Islam provides guidance on the day to day basis on how to treat friend, on how to treat friends, family, college at work, how to use financial resource for the good of themselves or others. And this is decision is repeat, repeated over and over and uh, mightly, uh, we hope that it might produce a character trait such as dependable, passion, or such discipline. In summary, there are many potential links between Islamic beliefs and practice with mental, social, and physical health. And this belief and practice may, may have potential to promote uh, uh, self esteem and peace for individuals. Research on religious coping. Religious coping, uh, the use of religious coping uh, to cope with and to make sense of difficult life experience, it might involve with behavior or cognitive. Uh, in general, is it related to fewer negative emotion in the vast majority of study that have examined this relationship in Muslim population. Fewer negative emotion means fewer depressive symptom, less suicide, and more negative attitude toward uh, suicide, lower anxiety, and less alcohol and drug use and abuse. Uh, a study by Hesyanti in, in Indonesia, in Aceh, with, with uh, 50 children who survived from tsunami in Aceh found that religious activities in this uh, descriptive report state that uh, reading and learning from Nobel Quran support emotional resiliency with the victims. We, uh, another quantitative study by Watson uh, and colleagues examined the religious behavior and mental health with Iranian students. They found that intrinsic religiosity was unrelated to anxiety but inverse related to depression, perceived stress, and positive related to self-esteem. Uh, the, uh, the third study shows that religious coping was again significantly and positively related to uh, coping behavior, which is, uh, or namely, problem, uh, problem solving, seeking guidance and support, seeking alternative reward and acceptance. Summary. Descriptive and quantitative study in Muslim countries 
thus far find that religion is consistently and uniformly used to cope with stress and distress. Another study with positive emotion. Religious involvement not only appears to help neutralize negative emotion, but also prevent addictive behavior and ad prevent addictive behavior, but also has the potential to increase positive emotion. Study by Suhail on, and Kaudry in Pakistan found that religiosity was positively related with happiness, independent of satisfaction, social support, income, and marital satisfaction. And also, religiosity predicted higher overall life, life satisfaction. Uh, a series of report by Abdul Halik in Kuwait uh, conclusively uh, found that religiosity was positively correlated with happiness uh, and life satisfaction, which is both similar were found in men and women. Uh, in summary, religiosity was related with fewer negative emotion and less emotional disorder in Muslim, and it's also associated with more positive emotion. Societal wellness uh, summary of social wellness uh, summary of research in societal wellness uh, involves numbers of domains such as social support, marital stability the absence of antisocial behavior and social capital. Uh, Al-Kandari reported that uh, religiosity was strongly and positively related with a number of cross relatives. The, the more religious people, Muslim, the more number of cross relatives they had, and also close friends. Although, uh, divorce rate in western countries and uh, although in western countries there are uh, divorce is this also uh, happens in islamic countries but according to suhail and uh Kaudri in 2004 positive relationship was happened between religiosity and marital satisfaction it is also uh, found with Handler and Genko study with 92 married couples in Turkey. They found that uh, using regression analysis to predict marital satisfaction with controlling uh, uh, submissive X scale, uh, submissive act, um, hopelessness and uh, problem solving, marital problem solving duration of marriage, marital, sty uh, marital style, and education, they, were, they found that religiosity was significantly and positively associated with marital satisfaction. Uh, another another uh, variable associated with societal, societal wellness is the absence of antisocial uh, behavior. French and college survey in uh, 183 Indonesian Muslim in Indonesia, they found that uh, 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 parents and adolescents report of religiosity and spirituality, and spirituality was related to peer group status, academic achievement, emotional regulation, prosocial behavior, and antisocial, and negatively associated with antisocial problem behavior. Okay, uh, another study by Brigatis uh, to, to, to uh, this is, uh, what do you call, uh, thesis, master thesis, uh, uh, try to find how the religious, uh, how uh, Muslim with uh, in a uh, level of spirituality might affect their participation in community or in uh, uh, involvement in the institution. They found that they concluded that the religiosity had a little effect to general interpersonal trust, but the, uh, it influenced uh, 
uh, how a Muslim uh, participate in the social service or activities. In summary, social and community health in general is better among Muslim who are more religious. And social health means greater social support, marital satisfaction, stability, lower del delinquency and crime, and so greater social capital. Now we come to the last uh, question here is, how do Islamic belief influence the health and well-being? The, ma the vast majority of research review in the previous slide suggests that greater religious involvement is related to better well-being in Muslim. This back the question, how do Islamic belief and practice influence health and their well-being? This is a theoretical causal model explained by Koenig in 2012, uh, which is summary the the research and uh, the presentation before. Uh, Koenig stated that um, submission to Allah uh, with practice a bit uh, belief values and practice in Islam such as attending mosque or reading a Quran or fasting or giving zakat uh, might influence the human features such as for uh, might uh, give the individual self-discipline, gratefulness or patience and dependability Be because they, they saw these features they might uh, have an increased positive emotion or decrease a negative emotion and a good social connection and these three uh, component positive emotion less negative emotion and better social connection then uh, were associated with their well-being and this is the last slide of me thank you very much for the opportunity of this presentation terima kasih pak imam Thank you very much uh, for your wonderful speak, uh, speech. So, sorry. <laughs> so the next session would be a question and answer uh, session. We have uh, currently around nine questions, um, which I will share um, via the uh, via the slide slide share. So uh, excuse me. The first question. Can you see the slides? Yes, all right. Mm. So this is the first question is uh, from Ms. or Mrs. Diana to Assistant Professor Dr. Farha Basi. How do you address suicidality? It's uh, probably suicidal rates in Muslim community given the stigma. To Professor Abasi, please. Yeah. Yes. So um, uh, thank you for asking that question. So um, important thing is when it stigma around mental illnesses, then of course, if not dealt with, and if they don't get timely um, uh, intervention, then of course, we are seeing a higher completed rate of suicide in the community here as well. So the most important thing I talk to them about is that first of all, there comes the awareness that suicide is happening in our communities as well. That is the piece that is very important to give them numbers, to tell them that our youth is getting as impacted as any other youth in the country. So first thing is awareness. Second thing is acceptance that yes, you, you, it could happen to anyone in the community. So it is knowing the numbers, accepting that it can happen to any one of us, and then how to identify those uh, symptoms and how to get timely access to treatment. But I also use a lot of religious narrative so it is interesting that when we talk about prohibition of suicide in Islam, it does 
you are discouraged to take your life or uh, because it is taken as a sheer act of hopelessness and is taken as a loss of faith, right? That you are not believing that your life can change or you are not believing in destiny or you are taking away a, a mana that God has given you. But when you go and look at the narratives, the close, there was a close uh, uh, person to Prophet Muhammad who out of his mental illness, completed suicide. And that prophet did pray for him. So the point that I made in the beginning, if you are mentally competent and giving up life um, just because you, uh, as an act of hopelessness, but if you are mentally ill, then there is more room to understand that as a disease model. If you are taking a, your life out of sheer pain or a, out of a disease, then it is not that, that Islam is very understanding, very flexible, very understands your individual uh, crisis. So we, have, we are again involving a lot of Imams in this, um, uh, this um, model that when imam talk about depression and mental illnesses and suicide completion in islam and when imams pray for these people then the stigma is breaking so we have had sermon on suicide and islam in a lot of islamic centers we are doing a lot of webinars around it and we are so again three basic concepts creating awareness giving them information creating access and improving access. Thank you for your answer. Um, the next question is from uh, Siti Patoda from University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, to again Assistant Professor uh, Dr. Farah Abbasi. The first question is, what, at what stage actually do people with mental illness should be treated with medication? And the second is, what should we take care of most before we could, um, I think it's before mental exhaustion for yeah. example, is the, you know, is it so, you know, thank you for this again, very important question. There are two ways we think of mental illnesses. One is severity and other is functionality. By severity, we means that they are at a point where they're considering hurting themselves or hurting someone else, right? So severity and safety takes precedence. If somebody is getting to that point, of course, you will immediately take them to treatment. But other comes functionality, that how are you uh, performing? Are you living to your optimum? So one thing is, how is your job? How is your academics, if you're a student? How are your relationships? Are you able to be around people? Are you, do you have friends? Is your marriage or your relationship working? So functionality becomes very important. If any of these areas are getting impacted, then it is a point that you have to get to treatment immediately before we hit the point of severity. So I think being aware of that. Uh, other small thing I teach everyone is that we uh, use this scale with, to identify depression in you. And a simple question to ask yourself is, over the last two weeks, if you take last two weeks of your life, have you been more happy or have you been more sad? And if you are answering that you have been more sad than happy, that is a very big sensitive question and criteria that if you have been more sad than happy, then I would highly recommend that you go and talk to your primary care or to go and connect to a mental health provider. Okay, thank you again. The next question is from uh, Indra Chahya, uh, again to Dr. Farha Basi. Um, how should we cope with a client who isn't aware of the value of religiosity or he or she is lack of faith? Um, so at this point, I would caution about one thing. So it is how I look at religion and spirituality can make or break you. So if your community, if your faith leaders, if your religion comes as accepting, as open, as inclusive, 
people will use it for strengthening, for their coping skills, for resilience. But if you feel that your God is punitive, is punishing you, yeah. or your community become judgmental of you, or your faith leader says, oh, you're not good enough Muslim, that can do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, we had this problem that families, kids, who, uh, youth who have completed suicide, their families were being alienated, were not being in included. So that's why when Imam started talking about it as a health issue, bringing those families into the community, that was very protective of those communities. But if we become judgmental, if we start saying, oh, you are not good Muslim, this is not the way to pray, this is not, then instead of resilience, it can harm you. So I wanted to bring that important message here that religion, spirituality, everything can be good for you if you feel welcome, accepted, and included. So we have to work on that. But if somebody is not religious, again, I talk to them, what is their coping skills? What methods they use? So maybe they don't identify uh, like a you know, uh, religious practice like, oh, I have to pray five times, but they still have the concept of meditation, uh, sitting uh, and quietly or just connecting to their inner power. So, you know, it comes in many ways. So we can give them, identify, sit, one important thing with therapy is you always meet your patient where they are. You don't come in with the agenda and say, this is what I want you to do. You first have to listen to them, hear them out at what point they are, and then you kind of guide them towards what is good for them. I hope this answers your questions. Okay, uh, the next question is uh, Indonesian and translated. Uh, so I, I, I try to translate as best as I can. So I'm interested in the effort to also include religious leaders in dealing with psychological issues. Um, can you please explain the procedure and how is that accomplished and what material should we give to these religious leaders? So uh, I can talk about America. Um, so there is a whole new um, field that is emerging, which is called Islamic psychology. So there is two ways we are approaching it. One approach is what I do, that uh, I am teaching uh, awareness around mental illnesses in general and mental being, and then giving if you are belonging to a faith community, giving them the tool of religion and connecting them to faith leaders or faith community. But then there is a whole different providers or branch, which is Islamic psychology. So um, you, if you are aware, we had the, the mental health conference. Uh, last uh, one, we had a virtual one and we had a whole track of Islamic psychology. So these, but I can tell you one thing, that I've been working in this field of Muslim mental health for last uh, 15 plus years, and I've seen a tremendous um, growth. We have a whole uh, section of uh, mental health providers who identify as Muslim mental health providers. We have the directory, we have websites, we have a lot of organizations that are working. And then there is a whole awareness in the imams, faith leaders. They are offering trainings. They are participating and doing this collaborative model. So I can, if you contact me afterwards, I can give you a lot of these resources. Okay, thank you. Um, the same question maybe for Professor Lukman. Um, is there such practice in Indonesia where there is a religious leaders in dealing with psychological issues? Excuse me, could you uh, repeat the question, please? Oh, it's, um, there's an effort of including religious leaders in dealing with uh, psychological issues connected with spirituality. Um, is there a procedure of that in Indonesian um, medication of uh, psychology? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm not aware. I, okay, I'm not aware of that. Uh, uh, if there's a issue about that in Indonesia. So it's mostly segregated between uh, religious leaders and um, currently, I, I suppose in the next step, we can improve that. 
Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we can develop that in a yes. community settings or some things that we could just collaborate with the religious leaders. At the moment, we did already that, but I think it mostly touched the physical health rather than mental health, and yeah. I think we should take it there. Yes, that's a good idea. So for the next question is from uh, Unisma. Um, I had a hard question, a hard time deciphering this. So I'm just copying it all. So for Professor Dr. Farha Abbasi, uh, if someone is diagnosed with panic disorder, I think it's um, how the how do they? I suppose it's something about balance. Uh, how how to okay. cope in the situations where the trigger is causing a panic disorder. Something like that, maybe? <laughs> um, I think what I understand of the question is that panic attacks can feel like that you are dying, right? So it is a near-death experience. And people, like I said before in my slide, that some people can take it like, why is God doing that to me? Or why is God uh, punishing me? Or is putting me in this situation? So mental illnesses can turn into spiritual uh, uh, challenges, right? You start mm -hmm. questioning your faith. And it is yeah. very common. We see that human beings, when they are put in crisis or are struggling with something in their life, they first of all can co either become very strong in their faith or they can mm -hmm. question their Girl. faith. Why, why should I believe in God anymore if God mm -hmm. is doing this to me? Um, again, uh, if you, uh, again, I, as a mental health provider, I do understand the spiritual aspect of it. But what I do is I talk to them from medical point of view first, that what is panic attack? What is panic disorder? I would explain that to them. And then I do as a practicing Muslim would say, but God is not punitive, God is not punishing you, but that is the point then I would bring in a faith leader to kind of help me improve the spiritual health of the patient. So we kind, that's where I kind of set up the stage for the imams to then connect to the imam so that we both can then uh, kind of uh, help somebody with their spiritual crisis as well. But as a mental health provider, it always starts with explaining them the disease model, that what is panic attack? So I hope this answers your question. Hopefully this answers. So the next question is for Dr. Ahmad Riliana from Nuru Ilma. There are two rules for our mental health, which is to be nice to others and to be nice to ourselves. But sometimes the second rule is hard to do, especially for an adolescent. Uh, with bad experience such as body shaming. So my question, so her question is, what should an adolescent have to do to increase his or her self-love? Thank you. So for uh, Tatrama, please, uh, the time is yours. Thank you for the wonderful questions. And um, my daughter also is in adolescence. So I understand that body shaming is one of the female um, you know, it's, 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 it's mostly on female, you know, like, why are you so fat? Why you look ugly? Why can't you dress a little, you know, things like that. The things that I always talk to my daughter is that you are unique. So you are uh, individuals with all your uh, faults. And also you have a good, um, you know, there's always a positive and negative way in looking at things. You just keep on thinking positive and just like, um, what I told my, my daughter is that write down the things that you love today. So if you found more things that you love rather than more things that, than the things that you hate, then you should be fine. You should be grateful and be nice. It's okay. So that's the first one. And then the second one that I always talk to my daughter is that, um, there is a one rules in my family. Just listen to me. <laughs> mm. That's usually what parents do, right? <laughs> so if I said you are beautiful, then you are beautiful. Never mind what other people think. Just listen to me and believe me that you are beautiful. You are worth it. You are worthy. You are love. You are 
um, you are special, just keep repeating that over and over and over again. Because sometimes the attacks happen from the outside looking in, but sometimes you have to be inside looking out. So I think you, uh, for adolescents, the problem is that hormone sometimes makes you confused because uh, um, in adolescence, there's, there's a hormone, hormonal changes that also affects your um, mood and that could trigger your um, um, mental issues. So you have to also accept that uh, so an, an, being an adolescent and you learning about yourself. So accepting yourself is one of the things that I always tell to my daughter and also I, when people, you know, I'm big, I never hide those. So I, because I know I try to lose weight. I try to do anything, you know, um, like uh, forcing myself to do. And then in the end, I'm still not happy with myself. So I'm, what I always tell my daughter is just do what makes you happy and then you will be okay. That's what they do anyway. All right, I uh, hope uh, that answers your questions. I would like to add one thing quickly to self-love. Yes, yes, please, you can. Um, Dr. Emma said is very important, validation, listening to them, uh, complimenting them, uh, and acceptance, increasing acceptance. But when we talk about self-love, we have to remember, so the way I teach it is, who is the person you spend the most time with? It is ourselves, right? Yeah. We don't think of it that way. So I also tell my, um, I have three daughters too. So I tell them, uh, what would you tell someone when you are, when you love someone, what do you tell them? Uh, so they will say, oh, you be kind to them. You be uh, complimenting them. So I said, turn it inside. That Turn that love inside. That now be kind to yourself be complimenting to yourself. But most important thing is the ability to forgive yourself. So yes. we always yes, are important told thing that. that forgiveness is healing. If you forgive others, it is a healing for you. But it is so important to learn to forgive yourself as well. So like a simple thing, like I was feeling so stressed out right now when my internet was not working and I was thinking like I'm bad, I should have done this, I, I'm not responsible, but then taking a deep breath and forgiving yourself and doing the best you can, right? So we all have goals and plans, but it is not humanly possible to live up to everything and the ability to do your best, but then the ability to accept and forgive your forgive yourself and accept your limitations so yeah. that i think forgiveness and kindness to yourself is very important yeah and also don't beat yourself up too much if you don't like everyone yeah. have their own train the yeah yeah you you have your own goals so don't yeah. compare your goals your life with other people's lives to because others. you have yeah. your own yeah Okay, so the next question is from Heather Kaplan. This is actually for Professor Lukman and uh, Professor Abbasi, uh, but I forgot to write. <laughs> Sorry. So um, that's fine. From from Heather Kaplan, uh, I'm not a Muslim, but I see many Muslim clients. Sometimes this is uh, in the format of clinical visits, where I provide psychoeducation and mental health orientation for new refugee arrivals, and explain how to access services in the U.S. Sometimes what I hear, though, even from people who are clearly suffering, is, "Oh, I'm." Uh, uh, very strong in my faith. I'm a strong Muslim. I don't need this type of help. This type of help. For a non-Muslim provider, what is the best and most culturally appropriate way to have a dialogue with someone who presents uh, reasons for not seeking mental health treatment? For uh, maybe Professor Abbasi first, and then Professor. Yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, what we do, um, especially if you are not. A practicing Muslim, but even as a practicing Muslim provider, first always understand the disease model. It is important. But then talking about spirituality, that no religion or no form of meditation is uh, punitive towards inner self, right? That you have to understand that suffering uh, is not like 
even in Islam. So um, I'm trying to think how best to uh, put it. So as a non-Muslim provider, of course, even if you talk about religion, they might not be open to it. So I think the way to uh, bring it up is that have you talked to uh, your faith leader? Have you discussed it to a faith leader? Because my understanding of Islam, and if you are aware of what Islamic tenets is, and if you can speak appropriately, culturally appropriate use words, I think they are very open to it. So you can say, uh, have you discussed it with your uh, our faith leader? But my understanding of Islam is that Islam is not punitive, that your God is not there to punish you, or God wants you to live your optimum life. Any God, any religion, wellness is very important. They want you to live your optimum life. They don't just want you to sit and suffer in silence, but to do something for your wellness. So that can be an icebreaker and you can explore. And sometimes it is like, um, okay, uh, I can, I, I'm not Muslim, but can you explain to me what is your model of uh, religious model of being sick? What does it Islam says about your healing? So you can, you even don't have to provide your own knowledge. You can walk with them and have them explain to you and then pick the cognitive disorder uh, uh, errors and question those cognitive distortions like you would do in any CBT therapy. But you can also work with a faith leader or bring in a faith leader, provider, the faith lead, provided that the faith leader has good awareness of mental health. Okay, thank you. Maybe Professor Lukman can weigh in. Um, how does a non-Muslim provider uh, dialogue with someone who presents a reason for not seeking mental health treatment? Prof. Lukman still muted. No, oh, it's still, sorry, I can't see. <laughs> I don't know how uh, this practice uh, in uh, uh, US, but in, in Indonesia, uh, cultural uh, cultural issue might affect how people come to come to uh, mental health professional uh, such as in Makassar for instance uh, individuals who has uh, mental problems might feel ashamed with their problems or with their self uh, uh, or family of them will might feel ashamed if they know that one members of their uh, family got in, uh, mental health problems. Uh, in practice, how Muslim uh, uh, come to uh, to the mental health pro uh, professional and how do we provide psychoeducational uh, uh, teaching with them? Uh, I don't have. Um, uh, what do we call uh, experience with that? I mean, I, I, I don't see any differences between Muslim and non-Muslim. I, 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 what I see is uh, how the cultures in uh, Makassar might affect people when they go to the uh, professional uh, help. Uh, uh, so if we want to get the maximum uh, uh, outcomes, we have to uh, put cultures as a, uh, uh, as a important aspect when someone come uh, to, uh, to get help with the professional help. Thank you. That's okay, thank you. Yeah. So the next, oops, sorry. Uh, hold on. Okay. So the next question, um, hold on, 
uh, here you do. So next question is from Pangalan Stikhatecha for um, all speakers. So there's one case in Brunei where a graduate uh, female in Islamic studies is diagnosed with depression and anxiety. She performs five time prayers, recites al Quran religiously, fasting, and and but her depression is getting worse each day and that that the doctor has to increase the medicine dosage to help her. What's your opinion in this matter? So please, uh, maybe we start from Professor Lukman. Oh. Wait, I think you're still muted. <laughs> Hold on. Right. Uh, yep. Uh, uh, I don't know what is the problem with this uh, uh, female graduate. Um, when she was diagnosed with depression and anxiety, uh, she might perform prayers five time, times and recites Al-Quran uh, as a way to cope with their problems. Uh, but when her depression is getting worse, uh, it seems that his problems, his main problem was not uh, treated. So I, uh, I, we have to look at what is his uh, 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 what is his main problems? So we can, because practicing practicing prayer and al Quran uh, is not is not uh, what do you call mm, is uh, is only a is it is only a behavioral. But if he he, ha uh, he has a problem like he hates it, uh, herself for doing uh, good uh, bad things, and he believes that uh, by doing that uh, sins, uh, the God might uh, punish her or him. That's make the worst of his depression, even though he got uh, type uh, prayers and recite Al Quran. Uh, Okay, maybe from Professor Abbasi first. So uh, I think we have to understand that these are two parallel processes that you might be praying or not praying can or not can, cannot help with your depression. First of all, we have to understand the underlying causes of depression. It can be biopsychosocial. So is there any other health issues that is contributing to her depression? Uh, has she gotten her blood work done? Is she anemic? How's her vitamin D level? Is her thyroid functioning well? Is her cycle uh, is regular? All those hormonal changes, all that so we have to understand the bio, biological piece of it. Then comes the social problems. What is her um, functioning? Like, uh, is she employed? Is she married? Is she, what is her status? What kind of support systems she has? Does she have family? Does she have friends? Is she talking to a therapist? So um, then comes religion can be a supportive tool. It cannot be the only cure of a medical disease. Think of it as if you had cancer, if you had diabetes, you would first treat it as a disease and then continue to pray to help you fun, uh, cope with your stress. So prayers are supportive, are adjunct. They are not the main treatment. So you have to have main treatment. And if her depression is worsening, then we have to focus on underlying causes or surrounding causes, what is contributing to her depression in the first place. Yeah, I agree. And it's also that we also had to reconsider that as previously, uh, there is a question before about panic attack, that sometimes it's, it was triggered by um, religious um like um attack right. or something like that yeah, uh, yeah so because of that and it's because of that and then she prays more and then she feels again you know like it's, it's it's kind of like a vicious cycle so i agree that we need to look at the person as a whole so we we can't just look at it at, in a in the light of spirituality only or a faith only or uh, Muslim ways only, but we also have to think like the, uh, like Dr. Lukman said, um, 
about that that well-being is more than just physical or mental but also societal uh, society and also wealth and also other things yeah okay thank you very much for the answers and unfortunately we have limited time and it's almost reaching nine o'clock um, in Indonesia at least. So um, we would have to end the uh, question and answer session. However, if you have questions which would you would like to be answered, you may send them via email, I think, to all of the speakers. Um, we will collate those uh, questions later on and um, we'll send them to the yes. uh, speakers. Yeah. And for our uh, remaining time, I would please uh, asked each speaker to give a one minute take home message uh, which can be useful for our uh, for for us for for the, the participants um, in you know what 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 message should they take home from this seminar uh, we'll start with dr rama maybe because you're on camera so <laughs> might as well <laughs> so please <laughs> from from dr rama first okay um i'm not sure i could give one minute because i'm i'm a talker anyway so the things that I wish that people would take away is firstly, that mental health and mental issues or mental care is important, is necessary, and also is part of our daily life. Second, I uh, want to remind you of the rules. Firstly, be kind to others. Secondly, be kind to yourself. And hopefully, um, and also the third one is, uh, you always find someone that you can trust someone that you can uh, rely on or someone that you can talk to, not just your parents, could be religious leaders, could be your doctors, could be your friends, could be anyone. Just uh, have someone that you can lean on, that you can have um, conversations with and talk about mental issues as health problems. So it's, it's not really something that you should be ashamed. If you feel sad and you feel sad for a long time, go seek a medical care. And if you feel mad all the time or you can't, uh, face something that you are feeling then come because we have of uh, um, uh, centers for that we have counselings for that so just come look for help uh, it's better to f seek help first rather than later thank you okay and then next um, maybe Professor Lukman can give a, a one minute take home message thank you uh, the central question uh, in this webinar tonight and this morning is whether religious involvement is related to better health. Uh, the, the answer is of course, but in understanding and examining the how this religious involvement might relate with uh, better mental health, we have to look at a various aspect of human, including uh, society and how this biological or genetics with uh, people might influence the mental health. So uh, this might uh, widen our perspective and on how the religious involvement of or coping with religious religiosity might affect the uh, uh, Muslim or uh, individual to have a better mental health. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the final last, last uh, one minute is from uh, Professor uh, Farah Basi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this was a great enriching um, uh, webinar even for myself, but I think I want to focus on the stigma that uh, uh, it is very important that we break the silence, break the cycle of silence, shame, which leads to stigma. We have to bring mental illnesses in open. To me, visibility is viability. Until unless we open it up and think of it, as in the disease model, we will not seek care. We will not have, we cannot provide support. We cannot seek support or treatment until unless we start talking about our own challenges and the challenges of the community and the challenges of the other people. So we really, it is important that we break away the cycle, we walk away from the shame and understand mental illnesses like any other disease. There cannot be health without mental health. We have to take the wellness model that was already given to us in Islam, which wellness in Islam means mental, physical, society, relationships, everything 
all together contribute to your wellness. But we have to absolutely under take away the shame and stigma surrounding mental illnesses. And my hope is that we continue to partner from Michigan State University. We continue to help and support any initiative that's happening in Indonesia to promote mental wellness. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for each speaker for your wonderful uh, speech. Um, for the last session, I would return it to the MC, um, uh, Mr. Imam. Thank so, you very much, Pario yes. and Professor Abasi and Associate Professor uh, Dr. Rahma and uh, uh, Lukman. I would like to ask a uh, welcoming uh, or closing remark from uh, Associate Director of ASEAN Studies Center from Michigan State University. Uh, Dr. Isabella Tirtowalio to give uh, maybe a closing remark for this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rio, Dr. Imam, uh, Dr. Farha Basi for agreeing to do this webinar. Also, uh, Professor Dr. Rahmat Riliana, Professor Lukman, and I would like to also uh, thank you, the uh, Honorable uh, Pak Rektor, Profesor Dr. Maskuri, juga Wakil Rektor Satu, Profesor Profesor Dr. Andes uh, Junaidi. Um, we are very um, inspired by this conversation, a very important conversation surrounding mental health, especially in this pandemic, especially as higher education institutions and universities. We continue to try to do our work we continue to try to educate, encourage students, the next generation, and keep their uh, minds and bodies healthy. So uh, uh, we hope for a continued discussion and conversation. Um, thank you again for all the speakers and what we are able to learn. And uh, again, thank you for this collaboration. And we look forward to the next um, events and the next conversation um, and hereby close this wonderful event. Thank you. Uh, selamat malam. Sudah malam sekali. <laughs> Salam sejahtera. Terima kasih sekali lagi. Kembalikan Dr. Imam. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Dr. Isabella Tertawalio. Thank you very much. Uh, and it was a very uh, great uh, international online event, a collaboration between Universitas Islam Malang and Michigan State University and also Universitas Negeri Makassar. Uh, I also would like to say thank you for the faculty members from Universitas Negeri Makassar, Ibu Marli Muiz also joining us, the uh, Vice Dean and the Dean from the Faculty of Psychology, Universitas Negeri Makassar, and also attending with us from College uh, University Perguruan Ugama, uh, attending with us uh, uh, Pangeran Siti Khotija, and uh, also delegation from Malaysia, and I also uh, read the chat, the message from the Kalimantan, from Sumatra, eastern part of Indonesia, and also from the Sumatra Island and Java Island. Uh, we almost have for about 260 or 70 participants tonight, and that's, uh, that's fantastic. And terima kasih, uh, Pak Rektor, atas fasilitasinya, Bapak Profesor Dr. Haji Mashkuri, MSI, for facilitating, facilitating this event. Um, terima kasih Bapak Ibu, thank you, and uh, we do apologize for any inconvenience, and see you again in our next uh, collaboration event. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, good morning and good evening. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I hope to see you again. <laughs> this is a wonderful experience. It was. Thank you. Yeah. Bapak Ibu, nanti email uh, this e certificate will be sent uh, by uh, a Department of Psychiatry from Michigan State University. Uh, Bapak Ibu already uh, fill out the form through the registration link that we send, and the uh, committee will send the e certificate via the email uh, that has been filled out by the participant. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.